Hey guys, you know this amazing drawing of my character? Or what about these illustrations for my dramatic reading of my high school poem, Mr. Mool and His School of Fools? As you may already know, this artist is named is called Koi Monster 22. Right now, she needs all the help she can get. She has just started up her website, Koi Monster Creations, and she needs all the commissions she can get. Go give her website some love and ask for some commissions. <sighs> Where am I? Oh, yeah. What am I doing in the heretic's pocket dimension again? Oh, hi. Look at what I just did. I like stuff. I like this, and I like this, and I like this. You did it! I was hungry, so I checked my fridge for leftover contra points. And I thought, hey, I can resurrect dinner. No, no, please, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Then I remember that I can't eat it all in one sitting. So what do you think? No, no, no means I'd love to, right? Who are you trying to torture? It or me? As much as I enjoy the taste of human flesh, I don't know if I can sit through another one of its videos. Fortunately, you can stand, but sit if you want to. That wasn't funny, heretic. <sighs> Looks like you're not going to give me a choice, are you? Watch the video or you may take the next train departing from the plasma cannon station. It's a Hobson's choice. Holy crap, that's a big gun. Alright, fine. I'll debunk it with you. Screw you. Oh, hi. I'm the heretic. Hello, everybody. I'm Postal Cat. Wait, weren't you Mike the Cat before? Yeah, changed the name. Okay, but why, though? Because shut up! That's why! Fine, fine. Hit it! Instead, I will be interpreting one of the most influential works of anti-capitalist philosophy ever produced, a series in multiple volumes that examines deeply the concept of the fetishism of the commodity. I am, of course, talking about Worth It, a series on BuzzFeed video about three men who are younger than me, who travel the world and try different foods that cost different amounts of money, and then say whether it was worth it. BuzzFeed? Aren't those the same guys whose male correspondents have half the testosterone of a guy their age? The basic idea of the show is to compare things like a $2 slice of pizza to a $2,000 pizza and decide if it's, well, worth it. As though value can be objectively determined by a trio of three literal low-T soy boys. The worth it boys, Andrew, Adam, Steven, these are not mere content creators, mere actors, dancing monkeys performing for ad revenue. They're philosophers, spiritual leaders even, and what they've accomplished on YouTube quite honestly, far surpasses the combined insights of Mark, Engels, Lenin, Sarge, Trotsky, Luxembourg, Gramsci, Lukács, Zarathustra, and even our dear breadmom, Kropotkin. Let's be honest, the bar is set so low you can't possibly fail to surpass them. Aside from dinner sarcasm, everything it said is correct. I would rather go to a couple of insnippid YouTube stars instead of any Marxist in existence for advice on how to run society. Wait, who said anything about sarcasm? Take, for instance, the case of the $2 pizza versus the $2,000 gold pizza. Which is the better deal? I mean, how would we even begin to answer such a perplexing riddle? We can find this out. If there's no demand to meet your supply, then it isn't worth it. That's how we know $2 billion slices of cheese pizza aren't worth it. So tell us, dinner. How do we quantify value without supply and demand? On the one hand, there's the use value, the commodity's capacity to satisfy some human need. And on the other hand, there is the exchange value, the quantity determining the ratio by which a commodity is exchangeable with every other commodity, deriving from objectified labor over time and expressed in terms of price. There is no theory of economics that ignores supply and demand like this. If we believe it, then a bottle of water has exactly the same value in the Sahara Desert as it would in Seattle. Go ahead, try selling it like that and see what happens. They're identical commodities, so their use value is the same, but in Seattle, 
They're just sitting there while in the Sahara they're flying off the shelves because water is valued only according to how much people are willing to pay for it. The same is true for every commodity. This is the problem of the labor theory of value. You can put as much work into something as you want, but it is only worth anything if somebody else wants it. Otherwise, every 17 year old would be a millionaire from the amount of man hours they put into video games. Speaking of, how is labor valued? Is all labor the same value? What if one guy can produce more in one hour than another? What is the price of one labor? Come on, I need to know these things, dinner! I like stuff, and I like shiny things. Now that's something everyone can understand, so let's take that as the first axiom of the economic theory I'll be developing in this video. So, given that I like stuff, and I like shiny things, let's return to the question. Believe me, it makes about as much sense in context. Is a $2,000 pizza worth it? Well, it is covered in gold, and gold is shiny, so I do like that. But the pizza itself seems kind of gross. It's got squid ink dough smeared with foie gras, stilton cheese, black truffles, gold flakes, and caviar. These flavors are overwhelming, and they don't make any sense together. You don't think the pizza is worth it. Fantastic. You should end the video, but I know you won't. You need to convince yourself that your subjective opinion is objective fact. I'm honestly speechless. I feel weird. Is it the gold? I just ate $250. I feel kind of like, like I'm committing a crime. And that's what $1,250 looks like. I can empathize. They're thinking of all the things they could have done with a $2,000 instead of buy a golden pizza. But you know what the best part is? They went and bought it anyways. What the hell is wrong with you? Really need that YouTube clickbait money, huh? You seriously blame someone's lack of impulse control, or even your own lack of impulse control, on capitalism? I guess it's just easier to not ever take responsibility for the stupid things you do, or for the money you waste on worthless crap? There's this kind of sadness that sets in as they realize that the $2,000 pizza isn't worth it at all, and they start to feel almost like they've done something immoral. It's a feeling I've had many times myself after spending too much money on some gilded piece of trash in a vain attempt to fill the hollow in my soul. You might want to have a priest look at that hole, assuming he doesn't exercise you first. Good lord. What if I told you the pizza was worth it? To the BuzzFeed soy boys especially, how much money did that golden pizza video make in ad revenue? I don't know, but I guess it was over $2,000. What's happening is that that decadent, unnecessarily expensive golden pizza added value to their company. Who would have thought? Capitalism makes golden pizzas profitable for both the restaurant and the soy boys who eat them. All this is fine. Everybody wins, so what's the problem? Well, whatever works, I guess. Is there a name for that feeling? Well, I like to call it <laughs> neoliberalism. In a post-scarcity luxury communist utopia, a bad pizza covered in gold would just be a bad pizza covered in gold. You might be mad at the chef for making a disappointing pizza, but you probably wouldn't be overcome with feelings of emptiness and guilt. A bad pizza covered in gold would still be a bad pizza covered in gold under capitalism as well. The only difference is that such a judgment is left up to the individual to decide. Some people have the need to show off the bling they can blow on stupid stuff. You're not going to change that by implementing socialism. If there is a demand for anything, no matter how stupid you or I think it is, people are going to buy it. And since your only solution is an authoritarian ideology that seeks to destroy economic freedom, using the same basic rationale that every tyrant has used throughout history, that being the common collective good? Yeah, I think you can see why we don't buy it. Which sounds better? A free society in which you are free to make stupid mistakes and suffer the consequences for them? Or a nanny state that will use any excuse possible to restrict your freedom or to commit terrible atrocities? Imagine being so arrogant, so undoubtedly, absolutely, unquestioningly, unthinkingly, unequivocally certain 
that you know what's better for other adults better than they know themselves. To fully understand why a $2,000 pizza is not worth it, you have to understand it in the context of capitalism. The price, $2,000, tells you the exchange value of the pizza, and if you live in America, you have an instinctive sense for what that means, because you know all the other things you could buy with $2,000. Yeah, I already made that point. $2,000 would buy a few months of food, or healthcare, or golden nails. And there's a lot of families who sit around the kitchen table every evening worrying about how they're going to afford golden nails. And it's that awareness that makes the shitty $2,000 pizza seem not just aesthetically disappointing, but almost obscene or even immoral. The only way you can do that is to make the assumption that the economy is a zero-sum game and that you are contributing to the suffering of others because of how much wealth you own or how you choose to spend that wealth because the economy cannot expand with the amount of resources available and adjust itself accordingly? Malthusian economics has been discredited for literally centuries. Your affluence isn't causing poverty. Now you don't value a golden pizza that highly, that's fine. But you don't get to tell other people what they can and cannot value, or try to guilt them out of it through thoroughly debunked economic theories. Because the problem isn't that Andrew, Adam, and Steven are bad people for buying an expensive flatbread smeared with gilded cream cheese. The problem is our economy fundamentally operates in a way that makes inevitable these repulsive juxtapositions of scarcity and abundance. Either that or the economy is working exactly as intended, supplying a novelty to meet niche demands. That might seem obscene to you, but the fact that it exists means there are people who want it. The existence of this BuzzFeed video is also proof that people want to see people eat it. The demand isn't gonna go away. I mean, sure, that would probably help with certain situations, but it's not gonna change the fact that the global economy is structured around cheap, exploited labor at the bottom and $2,000 pizzas at the top. Dinner, you think price comes from labor and time ratios? You don't get to define more exploitation. Another way to approach this issue might be to ask, who are the goddamn reptiles? Well, there's Senator John McCain, Queen Elizabeth, former head of the Federal Reserve Ben Bernanke, Governor Mitt Romney, House Minority Leader Nazi Pelosi, and though I can't confirm this, Facebook founder and CEO Mike Zuckerberg, as well as myself. This is by no means a complete list, but most of these guys are priests of statism. Well, they're certainly not the Jews. I want to be clear, get everyone on the same page, that I'm not blaming the Jews for anything. Are you sure? Not even a little bit? Because apparently there's no similarity between the anti-Semitism present in National Socialism and the violent hatred that lefties have for rich people. <laughs> Except, you know, cucking the white race. But to be fair, someone had to cuck them. The white race has really been getting on my nerves lately. All rise for our two minutes of hate. So the lizards are not the Jews. They're not reptilians from Alpha Draconis. They're not Freemasons or globalists or the gay agenda. But the key insight is that they're not even really the capitalists. The lizards are capital itself. Wow, uh, that's quite a claim. I don't know how I feel about that. And what does that mean? Well, I don't know, but it does make me sound like I've read a lot of Marx, doesn't it? So you have no idea what you're talking about, basically. Ugh, just, just get in my belly already. So the real point of the golden pizza is that it's emblematic of the fact that the extreme economic inequalities of our society are laughably unjustifiable. We got it, thanks. But unjustifiable? How? I could totally justify it. Most of those people got their wealth because they made something that a lot of people want to buy. Do I need to say anything more? What more justification do you need? Don't like their product? Don't give them your money! It's that simple! 
Is it really too much work to own up to the fact that you are a free agent and can act for yourself? If I were to translate the meaning of the golden pizza into an argument, it would go something like this. Capitalism as we know it is a defective economic system because, although it's good at creating large amounts of wealth, it distributes that wealth in an incredibly inefficient way, where efficiency is understood not as the capacity to maximize total wealth, but as the capacity to maximize human happiness. If your goal is maximizing happiness, then you've just opened a whole new can of worms. Don't get me wrong, making people happy is a laudable goal. But for a lot of people, happiness means golden pizzas. But that's not allowed, is it? According to you, that one person's happiness prevents three others from being happy. Therefore, it makes perfect sense to stifle their happiness, doesn't it? Three people versus one is mathematically preferable. No. It doesn't matter if everybody on the planet minus one person can be made happy at the expense of that one person. To do so, you would need to initiate force against the one person, and the initiation of force cannot be justified. The goal of society should not be to maximize happiness. That's something everyone needs to figure out for themselves, and it's definitely not your responsibility to make me happy. So what I look for in a good economic system is that it produces the most happiness for the people who are a part of it. So if you're willing to go along with this, the first question we should ask is, does having more wealth make people happier? And we actually have data about that, at least within the context of our own economic system. And the data shows that more income does lead to more happiness up to a certain point. But the happiness benefit of increased income plateaus is somewhere between sixty-five and ninety-five thousand dollars a year. Happiness. Compared to what? Are the people who are being oppressed and murdered under socialist regimes any happier than the wealthy people who fail to find happiness in materialism and other forms of idolatry? And if wealth doesn't increase happiness, why do you covet other people's wealth, especially since the economy is not a zero-sum game anyway? Why do you care so much about restricting people's economic freedom under the guise of increasing their happiness. People have the right to suffer the consequences of their own actions. They have the right to be unhappy if they choose to be that way. There's this amazing chapter from a book by John Taylor called The Government of God. He makes the same point about how wealth does not necessarily increase happiness. But then he asks the question, would socialism help? Absolutely not. Link in the description. If that interpretation is correct, then the current income distribution seems really irrational, at least if the goal is to maximize happiness. The income distribution in the United States is skewed toward the upper extreme, so that the national mean income is around $72,000, right in the plateau zone, but the national median income is around $59,000. What's this obsession with distribution anyway? As though there's some big pile of cash that capitalists just hand out arbitrarily. I know you socialists love your central planning, but stop projecting that onto us, please. Now granted, there are legitimate problems, but the so-called income distribution and wealth distribution is a symptom, not a cause, mainly of the coercive monopoly picking winners and losers in the economy for political or personal reasons rather than merit. You get rid of corporate subsidies, eliminate or just simplify the tax system, and eliminate regulations that prevent entry into the market. I can guarantee you, you'd see those gaps narrow, significantly. So at least to my naive eyes, what it looks like is that millions of people in this country don't have enough money to securely afford food, housing, education, and healthcare, while a few million others are like constantly gorging themselves on golden pizzas or something. But I'm guessing it's even worse than that, because it's not just that some people don't have enough money to meet all of their needs, it's that they have to be poor while other people are rich. Naive is right. You apparently have no idea what is causing any of the problems you cite, other than WEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEE
but yeah, but at least your supposed good intentions are enough to wash your hands clean of their blood, so that makes it all okay, right? Right? Piss off. I'm leaving. Oh, hi. You seem to have accidentally wandered off before we could finish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, silly me. I'll get back here. Clearly dinner has a point about the goddamn reptiles. And since people compare themselves to others, that leads to all kinds of additional anxieties and resentments and social tensions. There's a study of capuchin monkeys that shows if you reward one monkey for a task with a delicious grape and a monkey in the adjacent cage with a shitty cucumber, the monkey who gets the cucumber loses his shit. And if you do this to humans for long enough, they start building guillotines. You can't compare the two. People earn money under capitalism because someone else wanted to give it to them. If your pay is unequal, there would be an infinite number of reasons why. Maybe you didn't negotiate good pay with your boss. Maybe you're bad at marketing or just nobody wants what you're selling. These are not arbitrary reasons, unlike giving monkeys different food for a study. Or like statism, such as what happened with the French Revolution. If it were arbitrary, you'd have a point, but it's not. And you don't. But that's just how it looks to me. I could be wrong. I mean, I'm not an economic theorist, and honestly, I don't really understand how the economy works. I don't even check my own bank account balance very often. I make the videos, I swipe the card. So look, if I'm wrong and capitalism is good actually, just leave a comment and I'll be happy to be proven wrong. We're not leaving a comment, Dinner. We're explaining, point by point, where you go astray. Since you don't know how the economy works, the least you could do is please listen. If you don't know how the economy works, then how could you possibly know if it's capitalist or not? For that matter, if you don't even have a basic understanding of how the economy works, then why the hell do you labor under the delusion that you can lecture the rest of us on how you think it should run? You're not nearly as bad as Thought Slime, who claims to not even read any of the literature for or against his position, but goddamn, you're really close. But before you do that, let's get some of the more obvious objections out of the way. Ooh, I've got a feeling this is going to be fun. Income inequality exists because not everyone does the same jobs. Some people work harder than others, and those people deserve to make more money. Well, sweatshop workers work really hard, and they barely make any money at all. And a lot of people who work minimum wage have to work multiple jobs just to sustain themselves and their families. It's actually a ton of work, and they barely make enough money to survive. I see what you did there. The solution is to ban white people. Yeah, real subtle subliminal messaging there, Dinner. Wage isn't determined by how hard you work, but how valuable your product is. A landscaper works hard, but their work isn't nearly as valuable to the economy as a banking executive. There's a lot of things people put a lot of effort to. I'm sick of having to explain this, but things are only as valuable as other people are willing to pay them. But minimum wage workers are unskilled workers. Why would anyone become an innovator or medical researcher if they could make a good living as a janitor? Well, janitorial work is pretty important, actually. Someone has to cook and clean, and I think people who do such necessary work deserve a decent living. That's great! Janitors are important. Nobody disputes that. The two questions that remain are, how much are you willing to pay for them? How many people are out there? that can do janitorial work. Obviously not much if you're lecturing other people to pay them more without putting your money where your mouth is. Ah, uh, socialists, always so generous with other people's money. But I also think a lot of people would find janitorial work boring, and I think that the kind of personality that likes to innovate and invent often isn't driven mainly by profit anyway. Jonas Salk never patented his polio vaccine, even though he could have made millions of dollars from it, because he just cared about humanity, and he was driven by a purpose beyond personal profit. Patents aren't capitalism. They're a form of government-granted monopolies that create distortions in the markets. Try again. Also, assuming that everyone would willingly motivate with the proper incentive to do so is incredibly naive, idealistic to the point of stupidity. If life is already good, most people wouldn't innovate because they see no need to. Some might, but most wouldn't. Most poor people who win the lottery 
don't use that money they went to innovate, discover, or create, but they squander it. Foreign aid also does not prompt poorer nations to develop. It d disincentivizes growth. On an unrelated note, do you honestly think I would be willing to have surgery done on myself by somebody who makes just as much as a janitor or a mix or a McDonald's burger flipper? You may be that suicidal, but I'm not. So let me get this straight. You criticize capitalism and yet you yourself make money on the internet. Hypocrite much? A few years ago, I was a broke philosophy graduate student, and when I criticized capitalism then, people used to say, Why don't you stop whining and get a real job and earn a living? You just resent capitalism because you're too lazy to put in the work it takes to succeed. There are many, many things wrong with you. I would rank any hypocrisy, imagined or real, dead last. Capitalism may have problems, but it's the best economic system there is. You wouldn't want to live in Soviet Russia or Maoist China, would you? Well, no, I wouldn't. Hello, I'm Tatiana Tankikova. I'm here to defend Stalin. Fuck off! Dosvidanya, fascist. Uh, I got nothing. Don't you hate it when these commentators try to be funny with these stupid autistic skits? I know, right? I mean, who does that? <laughs> <laughs> so, granted, a lot of past communist regimes were shitty, but that doesn't mean that the current system is the best and final system for all time. My approach to this topic is not to try to resurrect Soviet communism or anything like that, but rather to identify problems with the current system that seem to cause unhappiness and instability. It's good that you acknowledge the failings of Maoist China and Stalinist Russia, but the implementation of a socialist or communist country isn't academic anymore. They ha we have real-world examples that are responsible for hundreds of millions of deaths. Also, you identifying problems is worthless unless you have alternatives. Our alternative is anarcho-capitalism. Businesses without the meddling of government. What's yours? More of the same murder and death? It really says a lot when the alternative you propose, socialism, is even worse than corporatism. If socialism is so great, why is it that half measures don't work for socialism, but it works just fine for capitalism? If you consistently fail to provide any better alternative to the flawed systems put in place, anything that actually works, you should probably keep your mouth shut before you speak another word of criticism about it, otherwise you are a massive hypocrite. I think a lot of people have this instinctive fear that if capitalism goes, so does everything we love. I mean, when I think of communism in particular, I think of austerity, scarcity, conformity, undrinkable victory gin, the end of fashion, all art required to be propaganda, just an all-around nightmare situation for a person of my persuasion. And it's not for no reason at all that I have these anxieties, since there was an aspect of that to some past communist society. SOME ASPECT?! It's their primary defining feature! Just look at Venezuela! People are starving! 90% live in poverty, and in 2017, Venezuelans lost an average of 24 pounds. You can criticize the gold pizzas all you want, but nobody's forcing you to buy them. But when you are literally starving to death because of government imposed scarcity, that's a different matter entirely. In before the monot real socialism crowd, the Venezuelan government has nationalized vast swaths of the economy and has soft-nationalized all the rest through regulation, dictated quotas, and controls. It absolutely is socialism. But the stuff I'm worried about, booze, makeup, art, baths, these things existed long before capitalism, and they'll exist long after it. And I know different types of people will have different things they're concerned about. Straight guys will be like, Will there be video games after capitalism? Oh god! And yeah, there will be. Tetris is a Soviet game, and it's one of the best games of the 80s. Capitalism is simply exchange of private property, which existed long before Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. The earliest known trade route was between modern India and Pakistan around 2000 to 3000 BC, and the oldest seaworthy vessels have been dated to around 45,000 BC. 
which means trade might be older than the state. So no, these things don't predate capitalism. The fact that these things exist doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best way to obtain them. The fact that there's food doesn't mean everybody in society is well fed. I'll make it simple. There will be makeup under socialism, but you probably won't be able to get any. Some of the stuff we like could probably even be improved if it were liberated from capitalist pressures. I mean, look what capitalism and the pressure to turn a profit has done to movies. Uh, compared to what? If you could name one classic video game made in the Soviet Union, then you should be able to name the classic movie made there too. Not only that, you should be able to name me a wide variety of video games from the Soviet Union. Not just a novelty puzzle game. Here's a little parable for you. There are two companies. One produces a wide variety of toys like super soakers, board games, yo-yos, action figures, dart guns, RC cars and drones, dolls, play-doh, whoopee cushions, and just about any other toy you can think of. The other produces nothing but fidget spinners. The first company is forced out of business by government regulation, and the second one is given a massive subsidy despite producing nothing but fidget spinners. What you're basically doing here is cheering on the second company for supposedly being the underdog even though the first company produces far better stuff. Let's face it, Tetris isn't even that impressive from a technical standpoint. It's not a bad game, but it's a game that can easily be replicated by anyone with the basic knowledge of programming and is normally played to kill time on the bus or at work. It's not like I'd purchase an Xbox One to pay, play Tetris, now would I? Hell, even if you compare it to the wide variety of games released on the NES or the arcade in the following years, it's still not that impressive. If the Soviet Union was so great, we, we would see more games than just Tetris. Also, do movies suck these days? That's a matter of opinion, but sure, yes it does. Yeah, they do. First off, you don't need to watch them. Nobody's forcing you to spend money at the theater. Second, the free market will eventually correct this. If the mainstream corporate media doesn't produce good content, there's plenty of internet content creators who are willing to fill that void. Like the fine folks associated with Planet Dolan, for one example. I would also much rather sit at home and watch YouTube poops made by Jimmy Davis rather than watch some of the movies released today. That's not an insult against Jimmy Davis. His content is amazing. I suggest you go check it out. Also, as worried as I am that political correctness will ruin AAA video games, I'm hopeful that a new generation of indie game developers will fill that void. Indie game developers who actually know what their customers want. Indie game developers who don't give two f about your left-wing sensibilities, unlike feminist, feminist whores like Brianna Wu, Zoe Quinn, or Anita Sarkeesian. I guess you're just mad because the free market has determined their content to be absolutely worthless? Not only do you bring up Tetris as an example in order to reassure us that the quality of video games or any media for that matter, won't decrease under socialism, you also cite games like Depression Quest or Revolution 60 as examples of games that are supposedly challenging the male-dominated game culture. The fact that you cannot tell the difference between games that require a lot of artistic skill and technical st skill to make, novelty puzzle games, or crappy, horrible games made by feminists who refuse to own up to their failures, speaks volumes. But isn't it kind of true that, at least in advertising, the function of glamour is to provoke feelings of envy and inadequacy in the beholder in the service of selling 
Is dinner for real? Oh my lord, this snack just described Marxism to a T. The purpose of Marxism is to promote feelings of envy and inadequacy in the eyes of the beholder. To get the eye to say to the head, I don't need you. And the head to say to the feet, I don't need you. Because the division of labor is a sin against the holy church of communism. Just admit it. You just want to murder rich people because you are every bit as unhappy and materialistic as the rich people you profess so much hatred for. But the advertising function, I think, is an appropriation of glamour, not something essential to it. And maybe glamour would actually be liberated if it weren't constantly conflated with advertising. So I guess my message to socialists of the world is that, actually, stuff is good. Glamour is good. Video games are good. Luxury is good. Baths are good. I mean, even gold is good if you don't abuse it horribly. Hey, it's progress. I'll take it. All we have to do now is get dinner to recognize the optimal way of creating and innovating stuff is through voluntary free exchange and respecting property rights and first principles. A lot to ask for, I know, but I have faith. You know, the most offensive thing about the golden pizza is ultimately that the $2 pizza is actually better. The golden pizza is an affront not just to the people whose medical bills it could have paid, but it's an affront to gustatory pleasure itself. So I guess my final take here is... Actually, champagne socialism is good. If history is anything to go by, it's this. Champagne. Socialism. Pick one or neither, but you can't have both. Unless you're a high-ranking party member. You like stuff? Well, I like stuff too. Great. We have some common ground. So how do we get stuff? The incentives simply aren't there for people to put in the work to just make stuff. People might do so out of love for their fellow man, but you can't count on everybody to do so. Even if you could, well, wouldn't that mean that men were angels and government wasn't necessary? The best way to get stuff is to exchange for it. I give you stuff if you give me stuff. We both win, but we can't exchange under socialism. Since nobody owes anything, the concept of exchange is pointless. After all, you cannot exchange with yourself. The only way to reliably get stuff is to exchange for it and the way you maximize exchange is capitalism. If you like stuff, then you should like capitalism. Part one, which you've all been waiting for. How to end capitalism once and for all. Well, I don't know. Who do you people think I am? I'm a socially conscious YouTube entertainer, not transsexual Gandhi. Are there any economic systems that don't require the initiation of force to function except for capitalism? I seriously can't think of any. Feudalism, mercantilism, socialism, mixed economy. This might be due to my lack of understanding, but if all conceivable economic systems inherently require violence except one, what makes the one that doesn't require violence non-desirable? Debunked pseudoscience, I guess. Oh, and don't pull that, oh, property needs violence to defend it, so it initiates force. If I'm defending, I, by definition, cannot possibly be initiating force, you dingus. I mean, according to Marxism, we can't just start the revolution whenever we feel like it. Capitalism has to fail, and that'll bring about the conditions that make revolution inevitable. So I guess we just try to relax and wait for that to happen. I'm sure it's bound to happen any day now. It's corporatism, which takes several generations to fail, as opposed to socialism, which only takes one generation to completely destroy an economy, or even an entire culture for that matter? Why is it that socialist countries usually implement free market reforms in order to save their economy, while market-based countries usually implement socialist policies in order to exert more control over its people? You know, maybe we should do something in the meantime. Uh, so, I don't know, I guess vote labor, tweet radically, try to eat more vegetables, uh, try not to be manipulated into waging war against other downtrodden people, and can we please not hand more power to the absolute worst dingbats our society has on offer? But you just TOLD people to vote labor. Cacistocracy is the inevitable conclusion of any system of government. It's never going to stop until we recognize the government for what it is. A roaming band of thieves and murderers, garbed in the priestly robes of their evil religion. 
The lessons of history are available to anyone who cares to find it. These ideas get people killed. Belief in them speaks of either ignorance or malevolence. You admitted you don't know how the economy works, Dinner. So listen when we're trying to stop people from getting killed. Look, I'm not saying you have to agree with me. I'm not even saying you have to embrace capitalism. All I'm asking is that you leave people alone and don't take their stuff. No. No voting. Smashing. Uh... Okay, that's enough. Are we done now? Yep, we're done here. Good lord, deployment of that thing should be a war crime. And I've lost my appetite. Now let me out of here. You sure? Not even a nibble? Fine. Nearest portal's out to the right of the Tesseract. If you hear the screaming of the damned, you went too far. Thank you. Don't make me do this again. No promises. Now go check out my, er, I mean Postal Cat's channel. Link in the description. Questions? Comments? Critique? Should I resurrect dinner afterwards for a part 3? Will adherence to this evil religion ever see the light? Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today. Now, if you'll excuse me, all this cancer has left me famished. <laughs>